good morning students today we are going to start the child's letter by eugene field eugene field was an american poet and journalist he was also known as the poet of childhood because many of his works were related to those which were dedicated to the children and most of his works were published only after he had made his death so here we are going to have a very prose piece of that person who had written many significant other prose pieces like this so let us start the child's letter before beginning this i want to ask you something students have you written any letter to anyone had you any experience of sharing your emotions with someone do you think that writing a letter to someone will lessen your burden will reduce your burden however if you have ever written anything please match your experience with this child's letter over here so from the very title itself you can guess that it's about a letter that has been written by a child but given to someone whom that child didn't know personally or she doesn't know personally but she has written this in order to demand something in order to keep her appeal forward so let's start everybody was afraid of the old governor because he was so cross and surly so everybody was afraid of the old governor governor now students generally we know governors of our country are nominated head or better to say they are 
nominated and they become very important representative or representatives of different places. Likewise, this governor is also holding an important position, an important place. But he was very ill-tempered. He was very surly, ill-tempered, okay, and didn't used to give response very politely, but seemed to be always angry, having irritation, and used to show ill temper. And one morning, he was surlier than ever because he had been travelled for several days with a matter. So, he had been troubled for many days with a matter, with an issue, which he had already decided. So, he had taken a decision, but Somewhat the decision was not accepted by a group of people and they were arching on and on. They were appealing again and again. So that issue had made him somewhat ill-tempered more than earlier. But many people wished for reversal of his decision. So many people wished for what? Reversal of his decision means giving completely the opposite decision, solution or order what had been provided by him. So, many people wanted somewhat the reversal of that particular decision which he had taken once. A man found guilty of a small crime had been imprisoned. Guilty, you know, done a mistake. So, a man who had been found guilty of a very small crime had been imprisoned. taken behind the bars, had been jailed. There were many people who were sure the man had repented of his crime. He was not in the habit of doing wrong, but just this once his circumstances had forced him to stray from the right path. Students, many a times, or better to say, 
V common ordinary mass, common ordinary people. Find many things very difficult to achieve and at that time few of us think of taking a short route to achieve that taking a shortcut way to fulfill his or her desire so here also this person had almost reacted in the same manner had done the same thing however he was not in the habit of doing wrong and many people had already been aware of this fact so they appealed to the governor to reverse his decision to change his decision they honestly sought the governor's pardon more so because his family needed his support they honestly very eagerly humbly sought the governor's pardon pardon to forgive anyone more so because his family needed his support perhaps he was only the earning member of his family so his family needed his support very much so many people thought or many people had evidenced or had realized that what had been bestowed on his way means what punishment had been given to him was somewhat much more than he deserved to get so a small crime sometimes begets big punishment here also we are finding the same case he had done a small crime but he was given a punishment that was much more harsher than he deserved to get the to all the solicitations the governor replied with an emphatic no the governor said actually absolutely no to all the pleadings that had been done to him having made up his mind the old governor had no patience with those who persisted in their pleadings so the old governor had no more patience to deal with those people who again and again persistently 
had been pleading, had been keeping their requests, appeals forward. So the governor was rather agitated that morning. He was very angry, annoyed. That morning, when he came to his office, he said to his secretary, Admit no one to see me. So he had directly said that he didn't want to see anybody for that case. He had straightly ordered that he didn't want to again face any of the appeals that or those were coming with relation to that particular case. I am weary. He said that he was tired of this constant and senseless petitions. So according to him, the pleadings, the appeals, the requests were senseless, were not having proper sense and again and again when they were coming to him, he got very much angry, he got very much annoyed. He got very much agitated. Irritated. The secretary had a discreet regard for the old governor's feelings. His presence of mind and loyalty to his employer did not allow him to disregard the governor's feelings. The secretary had a very confidential or better to say secretive manner of approaching to what his boss used to say to him. He was very much loyal to his employer and did not want to disregard the governor's or his master's feelings as such. He didn't want to disobey him. He didn't want to refuse what had been told by his master or boss. He bolted the door, so he had locked the door and sat himself down at his modest desk and got busy with his work.
sorting the mail that had come for the governor. So he was again busy with his work by sorting, searching and taking the relevant wants. The males that had arrived for the governor. His attention to duty was more intense than usual. For never before had the secretary seen the old governor in such a foul mood. The mood of the governor was very bad than ever. So, his secretary's attention to duty was more intense. So, he was very much serious to his work than usually he used to be because his boss was not in a good mood. Has the mail come? Where are the papers and the letters? Demanded the governor in a gruff voice. The governor therefore searched for important documents, important official letters and other documents in a very rude tone, in a very rough voice, with anger. But it was in a low tone. Here they are, sir, said the secretary as he put the bundle on the old governor's table. These are addressed to you privately. The business letters are on my desk. Would you like to see them now? The secretary then addressed his boss and said about the letters or other documents which had arrived for him. And he had been also told that some of them are addressed personally to him or they are private letters and some are business letters or related to any official purpose and those were kept or those are kept in the desk of the secretary himself. Then he had asked him whether he would like to see them all then and there after he had been searching for them.
No, not now, growled the governor. Again, the governor said something in a very rough voice, rough manner. He growled. He almost shouted or he almost said with a very rude tone. No, not now. I will read the papers and my private correspondence first. So he decided to read the papers, some important documents and some private letters that were being specially arrived for him. But the governor again found a cause for uneasiness in this employment. The papers discussed the affair of the imprisoned man and these private letters came from some of the governor's friends who strangely enough exhibited an interest in the prisoner's affair. The governor was highly disgusted. So the governor had found almost all the papers and the private letters which even arrived from his friends were strangely having an appeal were strangely related to the prisoners or better to say that prisoners affair or issue only. They all were of the same opinion or were having almost the same opinion that he should be pardoned. And the governor became highly disgusted. He became extremely annoyed with all those things again coming for the same purpose that he didn't want to see or listen again. Next para. They should mind their own business, muttered the old governor. So he again told in his angry tone that the people who were writing those things should mind should control, should look after their own or after their own issues. They shouldn't show so much interest. They shouldn't show so much interest in the affair. of that prisoner. The papers are very officious and this other people are simply impertinent. Students officious means offering once services 
where they are not asked for or needed. An impertinent means showing rudeness or disrespect to a certain cause. The governor was very angry with the reactions of other people who were telling him, who were appealing him again and again to change his decision. And he thought that they were not seriously concerned about that and they were somewhat disrespecting his opinion or the decision that he had taken. Then he said, my mind is made up. Nothing shall change me. So he had taken already a decision that he didn't want to change at any cost. That he didn't want to alter at any cost. He was sticking to what he had said. The governor rang the bell and asked his private secretary to bring the business letters. The private secretary could hear the old governor growling and fumbling over the pile of correspondence. He knew why the old governor was so vexed. Many of these letters were petitions from the people concerned about the affair of the imprisoned man. Oh, how they angered the governor. The governor rang the bell, rang the bell to call his own private secretary, assistant to bring the business letters. The private secretary could hear clearly that his old governor was once again growling. Means he got very angry and he was muttering something on his own and fumbling means searching one over the another or sometimes taking one file or taking one letter, sometimes another. So he was not fixedly going through the series of things that were being given to him. Rather, he was fumbling, taking on one, then another, abruptly. Suppose he was searching something or to search something. He knew why the old governor was so vexed 
so irritated, so angry again, so problematic or uh, so seemed to be troubled in problem. Many of these letters were petitions. So the reason was that the letters or many of those letters which had arrived to him were petitions or appeals again from some common people who were concerned about the issue of that imprisoned man. Oh, how they angered the governor. So he was thinking privately. He was thinking and he was telling to himself that although the governor disliked again and again going through the same case, but he was being forced to do so and this somewhat angered him more and more. Hump said the governor at last, I'm glad I'm done with them. They are no more, I suppose. The secretary made no reply, which was unusual. So the governor at last was somewhat relieved by thinking that he was having or he was not to receive any more letters or appeals further for that prisoner. So he was glad, he was happy. But secretary, his secretary, made no reply. His secretary had given no response to him and which was very much unusual. Not ordinary or didn't used to be seen regularly as such, which was somewhat strange, unusual. The governor experienced and shrewd as he was, suspected something. He willed in his chair and searching regarded the secretary over his spectacles. He saw that the secretary was strangely embarrassed. The governor had found that his secretary was embarrassed with any issue or a particular issue. He was experienced, the governor was experienced and his reaction was almost 
as shrewd, rude, as he generally was. He wilt in his chair, so he wilt, so there was a will or there were wills better to say in his chair, which he was turning to go or to move from one position to another and searching something very intently. Next para, you have not shown me all, have you? Said the governor sternly. What is it you have kept back? So, by the reaction of his secretary, he could understand that his assistant was hiding something from him. So he said somewhat sternly, rudely again. What is it you have kept back? So what is the thing that you have hidden from my eyes? The secretary said, I had thought not to show it to you. It is nothing but a little child's letter. I thought I should not bother you with it. So the secretary was very much concerned about the anger of his boss. He was very much aware of the fact that the governor was annoyed all those days with what he had got. So he didn't want to irritate him more. He didn't want to make him disturbed again. So he said that it was nothing important that he was hiding but a child's letter, little child's letter. The governor was interested. A child's letter? What could it be about? Such a thing had never happened to him before. So he was very much interested. He was very much curious to know that a letter from a child would have been or what it would have been for or why the child had sent that letter to a formal place like his own office. So he got very much interested, curious to know. A child's letter? Let me see it, said the governor. And although his voice was harsh, somewhat of a tender light came into his eyes. So a tender light, a soft light or better to say a softness, a touch of softness, 
or you know look which was revealing his softness got revealed through his eyes it's nothing but a scroll explained the secretary so the secretary said that it was nothing but something very unimportant something very coarsely written something a child would have expected with or something which have been expected from a child herself and it comes from the prisoner's child macton's little girl so macton's little girl had written that macton the forger 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 is a person guilty of deceiving by imitating and producing fraudulent copies so he had forged some important documents made duplicate copies of some important documents so forging is basically a crime related to imitating copying illegally stealing so macton the forger you know of course there's nothing to it a mere scrawl for the child is only 4 years old but the gentleman who sent it says the child brought it to him and asked him to send it to the governor and then perhaps the governor would send her papa home so that very letter was concerned about none other then his own father who was accused of a small crime a crime of forging and he was being bestowed with harsher punishment that i had already told you that he didn't deserve so here after appeals of so many people this very girl little girl had sent a letter herself to the governor with an appeal to send back his father home back to his home the governor took the letter and scanned it curiously what a wonderful letter it was and who but a little child could have written it such strange markings and such crooked lines oh it was a wonderful letter as you can imagine so it was a very beautiful letter that someone who deals 
with it heartily with his or her bottom of the heart could only understand it. So here also the case was similar. The governor was somewhat heartily going through that letter and he scanned it curiously, observed each and every letter with curiosity and he found it the most wonderful thing that he would have ever in his life. With such strange markings, such particular markings which a little girl can only make, such crooked lines. Though the lines were not straight, crooked, they got somewhat disrupted here or there, but they revealed the wonderful, beautiful heart, acute emotions, soft appeal, polite appeal, better to say softness of a little girl's heart. So, oh, it was a wonderful letter. So, the governor also somewhat recognized it that it was really a very beautiful letter that one can ever imagine, ever think of. But the governor saw something more than the strange markings and crooked lines and root penciling. Students, already I told you that he could see the emotions, the softness that the little girl child was having in her heart. So he could see many things beyond the lines only or beyond those written words. He could see in and between the lines of the little child's letter a sweetness and a pathos he had never seen before. So, a kind of sweetness, cuteness mixed with pathos, something or better to say a feeling that moves one to feel pity. So, a kind of deep grief, deep sadness that moves someone who hears that or evidences that or 
listens to it. So someone's acute sorrow, someone's acute heart rendering sadness next line on the crumpled sheet he found a love like the love his bereaved heart had vainly yearned for oh so many years bereaved suffering the death of a loved one here we can also say that a saddened heart a heart filled with pain grief sorrow painful heart so on the crumpled sheet so on that sheet which was not strict enough which was somewhat crumpled he found a love like the love his bereaved heart had vainly yearned for oh so many years so somewhere he was yearning he was longing for that kind of love for many years which he hadn't got he envisioned a little head bending over the crumpled page a dimpled hand toiling at at its labor of love and an honest little face smiling at the thought that this labor would not be in vain and how varied the little hand grew and how sleepy the little head become but the loyal little heart throbbed on and on with the patient joy and neither hand nor head rested till the task was done so he envisioned he dreamed dreamed by staying awake only he had imagined a little head bending over the crumpled page so those crooked pages or that crooked page would have a little head little head of a small child who was toiling laboring hard to write that to write that letter of love letter of love which was dedicated to his father and was written most humbly and an earnest little face so eager little face 
smiling at the thought that this labor would not be in vain. So a heart that was filled with full of hope that her toil, her labor, her hard labor would not go in vain. And how varied the little hand grew. So how much tired that little hand would have grown. And how sleepy the little head would have become. But the loyal little heart throbbed on and on with patient joy and neither hand nor head rested till the task was done. So after getting tired also that little child would not have ceased, ceased writing her emotions, her hardcore feelings to that governor, her appeal that she wanted to keep forward. So it was the most humble letter. It was the most cute letter. It was the most affectionate letter that the governor would have ever in his life. So the letter of that little girl had somewhat made him feel the love that was hidden in it. Sweet innocence of childhood who trouble you who dare to bring upon you one shadow of sorrow? Who would not rather brave all dangers, endure all hardships, and bear all burdens to shield you from the worldly ills you still cannot dream of? So, sweet innocence of childhood. The governor exclaimed very beautifully. So that state of being unaware of the complexities of the world belong to the adults. The state of that simplicity, the state of that extreme happiness, the state of that spontaneity, so the sweetness that is evolving one's childhood, especially that sweet innocence is somewhat very blessed, very thing or very state 
that had been given by the Almighty or that has been given by the Almighty Himself who would trouble you? The governor is asking. Suppose to himself or by seeing that letter in his mind only that who dares to trouble you, who dares to shake that tender soul, who dares to not fulfill that small God-gifted being's wishes. So who would not rather brave all dangers, endure all hardships, and bear all burdens to shield you from the worldly ills. So one can fight, one can brave all dangers that this world, that this society can give to one. One can tolerate, one can have or bear all the hardships and pressures to make that little girl child or to make that small child safe from the worldly ills, ills, wrongs, complexities, scenes of this world. So thought the old governor as he looked upon the crumpled page and saw and heard the pleadings of the child. From the crumpled page he could hear a thousand gentle voices that murmured in his ears so sweetly that his heart seemed full of tears. So that governor's heart at last had melted, had melted out of the emotions, out of his realization that how that small innocent child was facing all those things, all the worldly ills that she should not. And the old governor thought of his own little one. May she rest in God's memory. And it seemed to him as if he could hear his own child's baby voice joining with the others in trustful pleading. The governor could imagine his own baby or own baby's appeal in that little girl child's 
later. The secretary was amazed when the old governor said to him, Give me a pardon blank. More amazing was the tremulous tenderness in the old governor's voice and the mistiness behind the old governor's spectacles as he folded the crumpled page reverently and put it carefully in the breast pocket of his coat. So here tremulous means displaying nervousness or shakiness and reverently means respectfully. So he was displaying somewhat shakiness, a kind of nervousness in his voice. The old governor was displaying a kind of nervousness to change his decision, to change his mind, to change what he had already ordered. So to change his decision. And the mistiness behind the old governor's spectacles. So a kind of mistiness, a kind of vagueness had appeared behind the old governor's spectacles. Perhaps he became too much emotional. He became too much emotional and he was crying. As he folded the crumpled page with great respect and put it carefully in his front pocket of his shirt or of his coat. Hump, thought the secretary. The old governor has a kinder heart than any of us suspected. Then when the prisoner was pardoned and came from his cell, people grasped him by the hand and said, Our eloquence and perseverance saved you. The old governor could not withstand the pressure we brought to bear on him. So students, the governor has a kind of heart. So the secretary know that the governor has a very soft heart or had a very soft heart that he knew. But he found that he had even a more soft heart than had been expected by his secretary himself. Then when the prisoner was pardoned and people came from different places, they said to him that our eloquence 
means ability to speak and express oneself clearly so their eloquence and perseverance means to stick or to have patience with something to stick to something to have patience to have endurance that had saved the prisoner so the people were telling that their eloquence and perseverance had saved him means the prisoner the old governor could not withstand the pressure they thought that the old governor could not withstand the pressure that they had brought on him but the secretary knew and the governor too god bless him for his human heart so the secretary knew that the governor had a really human heart a very tender heart soft heart he knew actual emotions of a person specially aware of the emotions of a small child they knew that it was the pure innocent influence of a little child's letter that had done it all that a dimpled baby hand had opened those prison doors so a dimpled baby a dimpled child's letter had only been successful had only been successfully melted the governor's heart or that governor's heart by which that forger that prisoner had been pardoned thank you students